Welcome to Living Water Bible Fellowship. We hope that what you hear encourages you in your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Stay tuned afterwards for more information. Oh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for being here for worship today. Uh, it's a great day to worship. What is it, July 26th? I can't believe we're almost to August. I, saw, I heard that uh, one of the school districts, uh, Colleen School District, they start August 10th school this year. Isn't it incredible? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, you guys are, what's the name of your district again? Sierra Grand, yeah, Sierra Grand, August 10th, and other school districts are starting a little bit sooner this year. It's just, wow, we're already there. Hard to believe. So enjoy the last of summer if you can. If you love rain and wet, <laughs> you're there, all right? Or just pretend you're in Oregon and you're good, right? <laughs> hey, we uh, got, uh, I, I, we're, we're starting to make plans for the fall, and as you know, it's a little bit hard to make plans for the fall. We're wondering what's going to happen and how we're going to unload things, unpack things. Uh, uh, we're going to have children's ministry start in the fall, and the parents will be getting some notifications on that. One of the things that's happening this week is a Vacation Bible School. Trinity, did I see you walk? Yeah, Trinity, would you come up and uh, share with us what's happening with VBS? Okay, and oh yeah, A any questions for Trinity? Okay. Like her favorite color or anything? Oh no, no, we won't do that to you. There are registration forms out there. There's uh, registration forms out in the lobby. Thank you so much, Trinity. So if you know of parents, if you know of families that are, uh, they're like, what in the world am I going to do next week? Bring, have them bring their kids to VBS. Have them show up 10 or 15 minutes early to register to get registered. It'll be a great week. We, we talked a lot about that this week, about our plans, and it's going to go really well. Hey, guys, let's, uh, let's start our worship with, with God's word. I'm going to go to Psalm 97. Psalm 97. We need to remember who's in charge. Amen? The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. Those, those images, those, that theophany, that, that power of God that, that's pictured there, the Lord reigns. This is his earth. This is his creation. He rules. He reigns. There's nothing that's happening in the world that's out of his control. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. People, we, we tend to turn our eyes towards man-made things, man-made gods, idols of our imaginations, they're empty. They don't save. They don't deliver. They don't bring hope. Our God reigns. Maker of heaven and earth, he rules, he reigns. He's worthy of our worship, him and him alone. Zion hears and is glad. The daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Our God is in charge. Our God rules. He's over the so-called gods. He's exalted over anything that we think is great and glorious. O you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his 
holy name. Lord, we're thankful for your light. We're thankful for your call out of darkness. We're thankful for your rescue, your deliverance, your hope, your gospel. We're thankful that you called us by name into your family and into your kingdom and into your, your everlasting rule. Lord, you reign. We acknowledge it. We proclaim it. We stand on it today. Lord, the world seems in so many eyes to be spinning out of control. We know it's not. It's firmly in your grasp, meaning we're firmly in your grasp. And so we come here today. We, we invite you in, Lord. We invite your presence. We invite you to reign and rule over us today. We open our minds. We open our wills. We open our hearts and say, Lord, come and reign. We would not want to be found anywhere else but in you. We would not want to be found anywhere else but in your loving and powerful and mighty hand. So we surrender ourselves to you today, Lord. We acknowledge your greatness and your, your power, your authority as we begin this service. Come, Lord, and meet us. Let us worship you. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our minds to see how great and how glorious and how truly wonderful you are. We give you the worship that you deserve today. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand in his presence. It's the song. It's the song of the redeemed rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation a Love song born of a grateful choir Sing this out It's all God's children singing glory, glory Hallelujah He reigns, He reigns It's all God's children singing glory, glory Praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. All God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. He reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. He reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. He reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they've just heard. Because all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word. Sing it again. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they just heard. Because all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. He reigns, he reigns. All God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. He reigns, he reigns. It's all 
God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns, it's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Sing that one more time, all God's children. All God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Amen. So we've just saying that he reigns, that he is king, that he is Lord. Let's take a second and on our own, with our own voices, say, he is holy, he is good, declare who God is. So he is so good, he is holy. Now that we've um, declared who God is, let's take a second on our own quietly um, to pray and come before God with our petitions, with our prayers, with our needs, um, come before him. He is our good father. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day His mercy, let's sing this out. Your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, oh, you called my name. I ran out of that grave 
out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day.
for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for you. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly, because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I see nothing but the blood of Jesus. For oh, my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, and oh, precious is the flow. blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing that again. This is all my hope. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
Jesus, we thank you that you shed your blood for us, that you died on a cross while we were your enemy. While we were in open opposition to you, you loved us. You came down. You lived a perfect life. You showed us how to live, but then you went on (laughs) to that cross and you died in our place. We thank you for the freedom that can be found in you, that you are the way, that you are the truth, that you are the life, that you are the savior of the world, Jesus. And we thank you that you are the risen king, that you did not stay dead, but three days later you rose again, and that we celebrate, that we worship, that we are here because Jesus is alive. Holy Spirit, will you make us new every day, make us more like Jesus. We pray for the rest of this worship service that we would listen, that we would learn, and that we would turn and walk in your way, God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. If you've been in this sermon series with us the last uh, few months, you realize that the book of Acts calls you you and I out into service in this world. The book of Acts is a series of accounts of people being called to bring the witness of Jesus Christ to the world, the good news to the world. Uh, Maybe you're like me, though. Sometimes you feel very inadequate or very unworthy of being a witness for Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, It's normal. I mean, who feels like they're on this level, like a super disciple or something? Who, who, who feels like they're totally competent and capable of being a witness for Jesus Christ? Many of us don't, and so many of us don't witness. Hudson Taylor was the founder of the China Inland Mission. He was uh, just a giant in the history of Christian missions. He was paid a compliment by a guy one time, and, uh, and he said, you know, I, I think, I think that the God has gone throughout the world looking for weak people to do his bidding. And when he, when he finally came upon me, he said, he's weak enough, he'll do. The sense that God's power is made perfect in weakness God didn't choose to use robots to serve him. He didn't choose to use perfect people to serve him. He he chose us. That weakness thing, we all feel weak, but God delights in weakness. He can use weak people who depend on him. It's a fact. But there's the other side of it is this unworthiness sense, the sense that we feel unworthy. Some people say, yeah, I hear the the call. I I, I know I'm sent. I know I'm, I'm to take the gospel. I know I'm to be a a partner in in this work, but I feel so unworthy because I've got this long list of sins in my past or all all this brokenness. If people knew me and knew my history or knew my story, they they, they wouldn't say say I'm worthy of anything. And so we get to come to the, the, the scriptures today and we get to read about the most famous conversion in the history of the church. And we get to see a man who is very unworthy, who God used mightily, to accomplish his will. God does, in fact, call you and I. No matter where we've been, no matter what kind of junk we've been through, no matter what kind of garbage has gone on in our life, God wants to use us. We are sent as Christians. Would you please open your Bibles to the end of the seventh chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 7, verse 54. I want you to know that God is calling you, and he can use you, even if you feel unworthy. In fact, I know God is calling you to serve him. Acts chapter 7, verse 54. Uh, This is the end of a long speech by a man named Stephen. Uh, He gave this, this this incredible speech to the Jewish high council, the Supreme Court of Israel back in the day, and he gave a very unpopular message. He told the the leadership of the nation that they weren't following God. They weren't obeying God. The leadership didn't respond to that very well. Look look what happens. Verse 54. 
Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What, what a vision. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. It takes a lot of sweat to kill somebody by stoning them. So they took off their outer garments. They laid them at the feet of this man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Jesus said something very similar when he was unjustly murdered. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So this young man, you know, he's under 40 in the Jewish uh, understanding of things. This young man named Saul, he's there cheering on this death of a righteous saint, a servant of Jesus Christ. He's like, yeah, give him another, give him another. He's a man full of hatred and a man full of hostility. He is not happy with what's happening with the early church. He wants it destroyed. Chapter 8, verse 1, And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So this Saul who's cheering things on, he's, yeah, he, yeah, that guy needed to die. In fact, I'm going to take it to the next level. I'm going to hunt down every Christian I can find. I'm going to try to arrest every Christian I can find. So he got his goon squad together, and they went door to door in Jerusalem. <laughs> Are you a Christian? No, okay. Are you a Christian? Come with us. Arresting them. And, and the, the, the long-term deal with Saul was he wanted to destroy the Christians. He wanted to destroy the church. He was, as they say, hell-bent on it, taking it to the next level. He, he would not stop for anything to see the church that he so hated be destroyed. He was going all out, all of his energy. All, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? What's his story? Look at Galatians chapter 1 with me, please. Turn over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. For you have heard of my former life, this is Saul speaking, the Apostle Paul. You have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age uh, among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. So here's this man who... Uh, he was born in a place called Tarsus. It's in southeast modern-day Turkey. Apparently, it was a beautiful place to grow up. Uh, mountains and the sea. And uh, in Tar Tarsus was famous for their black wool. They would make these, these black wool in tents that traveled all over the, the ancient Near East. He grew up in that. His, his dad was a, a wealthy man. His dad was a Roman citizen. He had privilege and power. Saul could have gone to school anywhere. But as a young boy, we don't know how old exactly, he went to Jerusalem to study under a famous rabbi named Gamaliel. Uh, he could have gone anywhere, but by the time he was 10, right, by the time he was 12, he had much of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, memorized. His, his, his education was the highest and greatest of the day. He was very zealous. Uh, and, and as he grew up, man, he wanted to be a star in Judaism. He wanted to be the, the top of the top, the you know, the cream of the crop, as they say. He wanted to be the best. He was zealous and passionate. He, he, he you know, outstripped his peers. All the, the, the people in the Pharisaical uh, party, the party of the Pharisees, they saw him as a rising star. He's going he's gonna to be a, a superstar one day. Okay? Extremely zealous. But he persecuted the church. That, that's a great memory that he had later in life. I was a persecutor of the church. I was acting violently against them. Imagine how many beatings he doled out, how many, how many people he beat up, how many people he destroyed 
You know, how many people, how many families he ripped apart? But he was a very religious man in the party of the Pharisees, uh, famous for it. Look at Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, please. Philippians chapter 3, just a little bit more background on the apostle Paul, or the man called Saul. Saul was his Hebrew name, named after the great King Saul, but uh, as a Roman citizen, he had a Latin name, Paulus. And so at the beginning of this journey that we meet Saul, <clears throat> he, he's an unbeliever, he's, he's a religious man, but he's an unbeliever, but after he becomes a Christian, the, the Luke starts talk, calling him Paul, and that's the way he went by, Paul. Uh, so we, we have here in chapter 3, verse 4, he's talking about, uh, man, people think that they're righteous by their works. People th thought that they were good enough by their works. Check me out. When I look back in my life, I, I, I was totally righteous before God as far as I knew. Though I myself had reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised in the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, <laughs> as to the law, a Pharisee, meaning very, very passionate about keeping all the law, every last letter of the law, every last iota of the law, they would keep it to the best of their abilities. Okay? To, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Okay, so we have this, this, this man who is brilliant, gone to the best school, under, educated under the best rabbi. He knows the, the Hebrew scriptures inside and out. And he's saying in his, in, in his life, uh, prior to meeting Christ, that was so important. It was everything to him. To be, a, to be a Pharisee meant you kept the law in such a way that you, you just knew you were righteous. And it turned into this religious thing where you earned your righteousness before God. And as far as he knew, before he met Jesus Christ, he had earned his righteousness. He had earned his righteous standing. He could expect as a good Pharisee, you know, the guy wearing the turban with a satchel on the front of the turban with the blue fringe robes. He looked awful impressive marching up and down the street as a Pharisee. His, his chin up. He thought he had uh, grabbed God by the tail and had God right where he wanted him. He didn't realize he was desperately lost and needed a savior. So this man, he, he sets out. Maybe he's, he's the rising star. Maybe he wants to impress everybody. So he gets the idea that, hey, this church, I'm going to destroy it. He hated the church. He was a hostile man, a violent man. He wanted to, to do away with it. And, and I think, reading through the lines, like he, if he thought he could accomplish this task, everybody would put him in the front of the line. Like he would be maybe a leader. Maybe he'd be the high priest, you know, not the high priest, but he'd be in the Sanhedrin one day as, as one of the chief Pharisees there. So that's, that's kind of his background. That's, that's, his, that's this, this man that we're meeting today, thinking he's righteous before God, but just angry and bitter and mean and destroying life after life. It's not, and I, I should show you just how far he went. Acts 26. Acts 26. Verse 9, just what, what was this persecution like? How, how far did it go? Uh, in, in the book of Acts, this conversion of Saul is, is so important that Luke tells it three times. In Acts chapter 9, and Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. This account is before King uh, Agrippa. Uh, he's telling his story. And just look how, how far he went in, in his evil. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did it so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. In raging fury, you know, he was ravaging, raging fury against them. I persecuted them, even the foreign cities. Now, the, the, the Roman uh, people, the, the Roman overseers, they, they had a uh, kind of law that the Jews couldn't take <laughs> lives in themselves, that they couldn't execute the death penalty. And we saw that in the account of Jesus, right, in the Gospels. But uh, he's saying, man, there's a lot of people put to death, and I was there, I, I was cheering them on. If they didn't put them to death, the goon squad, what they would do was, they, they would interview people, and, and again, we, we kind of know this from history, the way it goes, like, are you a Christian? If not, recant. Tell me right now you're not a Christian. But if you are a Christian, they, they, they'd interview him and they, they'd get him to the point of blasphemy where they would say, yeah, Jesus is Lord. 
You know, and then what they would do often would flog the guy or the gal, is rip up their back, beat them, beat them half to death, or they put them in prison. So what he's doing is ripping apart families, he's ripping apart communities, he's putting people in, in, in prison. We don't know how many people actually died uh, uh, because of Saul. And so what I, you're getting my point, that this isn't a godly man. He's the most moral man you can ever meet. And there's a difference between morality and godliness. Jesus goes into that in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. They think they're keeping the law, the surface level obedience, but there's a spirit of the law. They're keeping the letter of the law. Yeah, I'm righteous, but, but Jesus says you're missing the heart of the law, like actually loving people and loving God. You know, and, and Paul was like, if you keep the bare minimum of every law to say you're righteous, but you miss the heart of the law, the passion of the law that's good and, and causes you to love God and love people. So that's, that's kind of the setup of this man, uh, understanding where he's coming from, his heart, hostile and violent and hating the church, wanting to destroy it. He loved his religion. He loved his Judaism, and he, he saw the, the church, these people who think Jesus is the Messiah, is a stain to be wiped out. Go back with me to Acts chapter 9. And look how he meets Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 1, please. <clears throat> but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now you've got to understand where Damascus is. It's 150 miles north of Jerusalem. It's like a five or six day journey. And, and he, how many guys did he take with him? You know, the goon squad, did he have 20 or 30 other Pharisees with him? Their intent is to go up to Damascus. Like, he's not satisfied just with Jerusalem. He, he, he feels like the, the way, the, the early Christians, they didn't call themselves Christians, the non-Christians called them Christians at an early point. Their name for themselves was the way in the beginning. We're part of the way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You know, we think that's where he got it from. But they were the way. He, he just couldn't handle it. He was so angry and so full of hatred. He even goes 150 miles. I mean, how many ropes and chains do they take? Carts? I mean, what, what did they expect? They're going to bring those people all the way back to Jerusalem and try them? Pulling people from their homes? That was his intent. He was full of hatred and hostility. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Arise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. In the three accounts, uh, we, we, we see you know, slightly different uh, perspectives on this story. The, the men saw the light. The people traveling with them saw the light. They heard the voice, but they didn't understand the voice. I mean, they knew something was going on, and they heard uh, Saul talking to somebody, but they, they didn't get it. But Saul did. Saul absolutely did. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. <clears throat> so the, 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 the imagery we have, the picture we have is on this, this journey north. I, I, I want to go to Israel someday. I want to see that land someday. But my understanding of the route is you go north from Jerusalem, you know, in our political age, the way things are, the boundaries are, are different now. But in those days, as you drew, drove north, you saw Mount Hermon up there. And it's a, a white, usually around a lot of the time of year, it's white-capped mountain. It's beautiful. You pass the mountain, and you can see Damascus. In those days, it was this, this lush, green city, this white city in the midst of a desert. It stood out. It, there was an oasis there, and it was just a beautiful place. But suddenly, as he's going down this road, and they see the city, maybe, maybe they're a half a day out. We don't know exactly. A light brighter than the sun shines. And, he, and, and, and Paul tells us later that, he, that Jesus appeared to him in that vision. It wasn't just a vision. It was the actual coming of Jesus. He saw Jesus. Uh, Jesus appeared to him. You can write down 1 Corinthians 9.1 and 1 Corinthians 15.8. Uh, Jesus appeared to him. He, he saw him, and, and he was blinded by the glory of Christ. He was blinded by the light of God. 
It, it, was, it was quite a moment. But can you imagine when he said, who are you, Lord? Now, now, Saul had heard the testimonies of so many Christians. He'd heard the gospel by this time so many times. As he interviewed Christians, as he persecuted Christians, he heard them say, Jesus rose from the dead. We believe in him because he rose from the dead. He heard so many people say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You can imagine how many times he mocked Jesus. How many times he laughed in people's face. <laughs> Your Jesus is dead. Your Jesus is, is this, 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 this impoverished carpenter. He's a nobody. He's a nothing. Making fun of Jesus that was his vocation, his joy. He hated Jesus. And now he says, who are you, Lord? And I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Talk about a heart attack city. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I mean, they just, speechless. He was wrong. He built his life on a lie that Jesus wasn't alive. We as Christians build our life on the truth that Jesus is alive. Amen. We don't have anywhere else to go. This is our reality. This is our worldview. This is our understanding of things is that Jesus Christ is God. He, he's fully man, fully God. He rose from the dead. He rules. He reigns in this world today. And even if he wanted to right now, the Lord Jesus could come into our presence because he's alive. He's not a phantom. He's not a spirit. He didn't disappear. He didn't go off into the ether world somewhere. He rose from the dead in a glorious, resurrected body. He exalted to heaven in that same body. And he's coming back in that same glorious, resurrected body. He's present. He's near. He said, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. And we, mean, we usually take that he sent his spirit into our midst, and certainly so. But he is here. In a way we don't understand. And, and just the heart attack that, that Saul must have had, just the, the eye-opening, even though he's blind, experience. Oh my gosh. He's the Lord. And I've been persecuting him. I've been destroying his people. Woe is me. Time to repent in dust and ashes. Imagine if you built your life on fighting against God and God calls you out on it. Terror, absolute terror. And so I'm not exactly sure. The text doesn't lay it out for us when this, uh, this regeneration happened, when this conversion happened. Was it instantaneous when he heard the name Jesus? That he just, his heart melted, his, his mind changed, and suddenly became a worshiper? Was it during those three days of blindness, of fasting, and prayer, and mourning, and weeping that he probably went through in Damascus? But Jesus, Jesus told him straight, you're persecuting me. And in the, in the Jewish world, we, Jewish, the, the Jewish people, they're monotheists. They didn't believe in other gods. So if there's a light shining from heaven and a voice coming from heaven, that's a heavenly being associated with Yahweh. He didn't know at first it was an angel of the Lord or, or, or an angel of God or what, but he knew when Jesus said it, it's him. So I, I don't know when he was converted. I, all I know is when I read this text, Jesus Christ took the initiative. He moved towards Saul, this evil, wicked man, even though the most moral man you could ever meet. In his heart, he was far from God. He needed salvation. He needed rescue. Jesus approached him. Jesus called his name. Jesus took the initiative. It's a beautiful thing. Now, there's several things I want to say, and I've already said it in, in various ways, but <clears throat> your Jesus is alive today. We live in the presence of the living God. Resurrection from the dead. He's the living God. He reigns and he rules. This living God, Jesus, has established for himself a church. He's decided to build for himself a church. He's, he's decided to call life after life after life into his kingdom into under his reign and under his rule by the plan of God. Okay? And so we don't understand as Christians, the second thing I want to say, we don't understand our close association with the risen Jesus. When you were baptized, when you were, when, when, when you were, baptized, you were placed in union with Christ, says uh, several of the scriptures. You were tied into union with Jesus. The scriptures say again and again, one of Paul's favorite phrases is, you're in Christ. He says, I, I and the Father are one. I'm in the Father. He's in me. There's, there's this radical thing. The Holy Spirit has united us with the humanity of Jesus in such a way that we are in Christ. We're not divine as he is divine, but we're united to his humanity. We're, we're tied into who he is. 
And so Jesus, when he says, you're persecuting me, he's making a statement about what it means to be the church. Sometimes we take our, our, our understanding of Christianity as the, in this individualistic sense, like I've got a relationship with Jesus, and it's just me and him, him and me. No, you're tied into something greater and bigger. You are united with God, but he's called all the other believers to be united with him. And so the church is this family. 1 Corinthians 12, it talks, it talks about if one part of the body is hurt, the other part of the body is hurt. If we suffer, one part suffers, we all suffer. There's this deep union that we have with Jesus Christ that sometimes we don't understand. So with Jesus, when, when you're hurting, when you're persecuted, when you're suffering, Jesus is suffering along with you in some mystical way we don't understand. And I think the application in that is, is sometimes in a church we're, we're distant from one another when God has designed the church to be intimate. We're a family. The, the metaphor the Bible uses, uh, the body of Christ we're a body, everyone doing their part, everyone together. And sometimes we, we feel like we're all, all, all alone on an island as a Christian, and we're not. Every time that, that, that Saul saw someone put to death, Jesus hurt. Every time someone was flogged, a Christian was flogged, Jesus felt the pain, as it were. Because we're in Christ, we're in union with Jesus Christ. We're closer than we imagine to our Lord. He's got us. We're His. And, and it's just... It's hard to put into words what that means because we come from such an individualistic culture and, and we don't under, understand the family of God, the body of Christ. But the big thing here is, is uh, I don't know, maybe there's somebody here who isn't saved yet, somebody here who hasn't placed their faith in Jesus Christ yet. And maybe you've thought that, man, God can't save me. God doesn't want to save me. God can't save me. He saved Paul. He saved Saul, a murderer. I don't know what you've done in your life, but if you think you've gone too far, you haven't gone too far to be saved. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in his work on the cross, dying in your place for your sins as the atoning sacrifice. Trust in him and he will save you. He will rescue you. He will, he will deliver you. You can be saved. So we don't know when the conversion happened, but it's a beautiful thing. Look at verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. I, I read somewhere that this, this Straight Street is still a main thoroughfare in the city of Damascus today. Some things never change. And at the house of Judas, look for a man named Tarsus, named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, that, that he's done evil among your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call in your name. And so Ananias is like, Lord, are you sure about this? And we, we, we all understand that, right? Our, our human fear, but God called him to trust. The Lord said to him, Go. For he's my chosen instrument of mine to, to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of God. So there's Saul's commission, Paul's commission. For I'll show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you in the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. We saw some of the healings that Jesus did in the Gospels, something like that happened. And he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Uh, so there's several things to say here. I probably won't, don't have enough time to say so much here. But we see here that Ananias is called and used by God. Is Ananias an apostle? No, not in the big A sense. He's not an apostle. He's, he's not a, we don't know if he's an elder in, in this, this, this church in Damascus uh, or just a common layman. But the point being, uh, I, I love it how he baptized is, he baptizes Apostle Saul, Apostle Paul. Okay? God has called Saul to be an apostle, a leader in the church, and a common man, a righteous follower of Christ, a, a godly Christian, gets to baptize him. And just you step back and you say, um, you look at some of the hierarchies in church sometimes, and, and we, we understand there's some order to church and some structure to church, but, but Christians are called to ministry. You don't need a pastor to baptize. 
right? It, it's, it, that's not the issue. There's not, there's not this transfer of power from a pope or a pastor or something to a person. <laughs> this is God's work. And he can use anybody. And, and you just run down that path a little bit about the priesthood of believers that God can use any of us in his ministry. He calls all of us to be in his ministry. He calls all of us to serve him. And, and he might call you to do very difficult things. Lord, are you sure you want to use me? He did. God doesn't make mistakes. He's called you into his family. He's called you into his kingdom. He calls you to serve him. In different ways. We, we, man, the body of Christ, this part of the body does this, this part of the body does that. Praise God. We're all part of the body. We're all called to ministry. We're all called to service. It's a beautiful thing when the church is on mission, doing its work. But, uh, yeah, so, so he lays his hands on him. The Holy Spirit comes. And, uh, again, we don't know. Acts tells uh, the story of, of uh, different believers Jewish believers, and then Samaritans, and then the Ethiopian eunuch, the guy from Africa being saved, and then, then uh, Gentiles being saved, and, and there's, there's a lot of interesting things about how uh, the, the Holy Spirit comes. But Paul says, I, I keep conflating the two, Saul says in his baptism, I am officially identifying with Jesus Christ. Yes, he's saved me. I am his. Uh, baptism is this time where we, we say, yes, I want to be united with Christ. I want to stand with Christ. I want to live for Christ. Really, baptism is the start of discipleship. It's a picture of what's happened on the inside. It's an outward expression of saying, yes, I belong to Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm following Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm going to keep his commands. You see, uh, um, as Christians, it, it doesn't mean we're not religious, we are religious, but we don't, we're not religious to earn salvation. We're not religious to try to earn righteousness because our righteousness comes from Jesus Christ alone. We have an imputed righteousness. As we trust in Jesus Christ, we put our faith in him, we receive this righteous standing before God, we're accepted. But then once we start this discipleship, this walk with Jesus, then we do want to obey him in response, a response of worship, a response of love. And Paul says, I'm all in. A baptism for the Jewish people is they were dipped into the, the temple tanks. You know, the, the Jewish understanding of baptism is, is they were dipped into those ritual baths around the, 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 the temple courts. That's not where Paul is here, but as they're dipped in, the, the imagery is the washing away of sins. It's a beautiful thing. It's this imagery of going in, a picture of a sinner coming out, a picture of a, a clean and righteous person. There's nothing magical about the water, <laughs> Because Jesus has accomplished this. Jesus has made us white as snow, as it were. It's a great, great thing. So he starts this Christian faith. He starts this walk, and, uh, and, it's, and it's glorious. Verse 15, again, I, I want to focus on that for a moment. The Lord said to Ananias, Go, talk to Saul, for he's my chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and children of Israel. Wow. That's weird terminology. Uh, it, you don't see that much in the Bible. He's my chosen instrument. He's the one, sometimes we see it in the prophetic literature. He's the one, my instrument. My, I'm going to do my activity through him. I'm gonna, like an instrument, a guitar is an instrument. I'm going to play my music through him. I'm going to use him for my glory and my fame. Ananias, go and bring him out of his blindness. Go and baptize him, because I'm, I'm going to use, this is a commission, and, and I, I, I have to highlight this, and, and so you'll see this, this murderer, this man full of hatred and hostility, this man who did wicked things in the name of religion, it's a terrible thing when a wicked religious person has the power of the state behind him. He left that religion behind and he entered into true religion, the following of Jesus Christ. And, and, and he was all open in baptism. He's saying, I'm yours, Lord. And God says to this wicked, broken man, 
You're my chosen instrument to take my message, my love, my grace to kings, to the Gentiles, to the world. And he did it. And I say that because maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, uh, Pastor, if you knew my past, you know I'm unworthy of serving Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, man, the wicked things I've done, Jesus wouldn't want me. Jesus couldn't use me. I'm unworthy. Not. In Jesus Christ, all are made new. You're a new creature in Jesus Christ. Your past has been cleansed. Your sins are in the bottom of the sea, as one of the scriptures says. As far as the east is from the west, so far has your sin been removed from his sight. In Jesus Christ, you give your life to him, you're made new, you start again, and he wants to use you. If he can use a man like Saul, he can use you. If he can use a broken man like Saul, prideful, arrogant, full of himself man, and change his life, he can change your life and use you. In fact, that's what your calling is as a Christian. The Christian calling, it, it, it never changes. We all start as sinners. Every one of us has been rebels. Every one of us has hated God in our own way. He saves us. We, we hear the gospel, the gospel of his salvation he died on the cross. He rose in victory. He's defeated death. He's defeated sin. He paid for our sins on the cross. We place our faith in him. He makes us saved people. Makes us righteous in his sight. He justifies us. Declares us righteous in his sight. In the normal, normal Christian life, we don't just get saved and then we just wait till heaven. We're all called into ministry. We're all sent so we move from sa sinner to saved to sent. That's, that's the normal Christian life. If you are in Christ, you're not meant to just sit around and, and wait for the rapture. You're not just meant to sit around and wait till he takes you to heaven. He's called you into the ministry on purpose. He's called you to participate in the redemptive purposes of God. He's called you to par participate in your own way, in your own, in your own setting, to share the gospel, to, to love people in his name. Apostle Paul's life, I, I need to kind of tie this up, but um, look, at, look, look at 1 Timothy with me. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Here he is, he's an older man, he's discipled this man named Timothy, and, and he wants to know, he wants Timothy to, to think about him as an example. Chapter 1, verse 12. I thank him, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Jesus Christ our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. <clears throat> Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Looking back in my, my life before I became a Christian, I can't believe how ignorant I was, <laughs> how foolishly I acted. Looking back on my, my time before I became a Christian, I, I, I'm like the Apostle Paul. I can't believe how merciful God was towards me in calling me into his family and calling me into his service. So to hear the Apostle Paul says, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. I'm the chief of sinners. And, and we're like, Paul, you haven't seen my life. He says, I'm the chief of sinners. And isn't it amazing that God in his mercy chose to use me, chose to call me. And, and he's telling this to Timothy. And, and Timothy, if he can use me, he can use you. Tell people that, Timothy. Teach that to people, Timothy. Use me as an example. 
man, church, you think you're unworthy or you think you're too weak. Look at the Apostle Paul. God used him to be an apostle, a leader in the church. The persecutor becomes a leader in the church, the one who caused Christians to suffer. Now he's suffering in Jesus' name. It's an amazing turnaround. Verse 16, but I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost sinner, we're meant to understand that, the chief of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? He, he, he considered himself, as he thought about the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and the blessings he received, the mercy he received, the grace he received, he's like, wow, God is using me. Timothy, God can use you too. Tell it to the church. God can use everybody in the church if he can use me. So how did this play out in, in Saul's life? Let me tie up this, uh, this story, this account. Chapter 9, verse 22. Verse 19. So he's, uh, he's taken to Damascus. He, three days he's praying. He's suffering. You know, he, he gets, he, but he's, he's converted. He gets baptized. And then verse 19, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he's the son of God. I think that's the only place in Acts where, where that's said it that way. And all, all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for the purpose to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. This is the normal Christian life. Not that you're going to be preaching before kings or, or speaking before you know, a, a world stage or something like that, but the normal Christian life is sinner turned into saint turned into servant. We are all in that same boat, sinners who have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And then God turns around and uses these broken former chief sinners. And he uses us to share the gospel, to witness of Jesus, to minister to people, to love people, to serve people. It's a beautiful thing, this grace of God, isn't it? Wow, he would use us and he wants to use us. Don't you think for a second, don't you leave here believing today that you're, that you're an improper vessel for God to use. I guarantee you that Jesus wants to use you to change people's life, that he wants to use you to make a difference in people's life. He wants to use you. I don't care how young you are, how old you are, while you're still drawing breath, he wants to use you for his glory and his fame. He fills you with his Holy Spirit. He fills you with power. When you're weak and you're humble and you're meek and you ask for strength, he'll fill you with your power and he can use you mightily and powerfully. You are sent. Sinner turned to saint, turned to sent servant. We are all sent in Jesus' name and by his power we can serve people in love and see God change life after life after life. Amen? Amen. Stand in his presence. God Almighty, we thank you for your amazing grace. We pray for the other churches around our state who aren't meeting today. We pray for those Christians who haven't been able to fellowship for a long time. We ask for grace to come upon our country that this virus would be done away with. Amen. Lord God, we ask for you to open up the churches again. But Lord, don't open up the churches again if, it, if we're making it all about us. Change the environment. Change the atmosphere. Lord, raise up the churches to go. Raise, up the church, raise our church up to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we know we are sent. But God, we ask for those who are suffering right now, who are in weakness right now, who are in pain right now, we ask for your grace to minister to them directly. Send us, Lord, to them. Lord, we ask for the lost who, who are so close to salvation, who are so close to crossing the line. Send us to them, Lord. Make a way, Lord. Take us as your, Lord, we, we would humbly ask that we could be your instruments in your hands, that you'd play us and use us in any way you see fit. We surrender ourselves to you again today.
You're worthy of our very lives, and we would not withhold our lives from you. Use us, Lord, to spread your love, to spread your grace, to spread your salvation. Lord, we look forward to the day when we're able to worship fully in your presence. <laughs> we can't wait to see the party unfold. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And go in the power of God. Go in the service of God this week. Thank you for watching this teaching from Living Water Bible Fellowship. We hope that this teaching was an encouragement and a challenge to you in your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Living Water is a Bible-based, gospel-centered church, and our mission is to lead people into a life-changing and ever-growing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're interested in more about us as a church, links and contact information are in the description box below. But be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell as well. Thanks again for watching.